Hey everyone, Ariel Adams here with the Blog to Watch on the Spending Time podcast. We have a special guest, Leon Adams of Cellini. How Leon, are you, Ariel? Good. Thanks for joining us. This is the first time that you and I have had a formal conversation. Absolutely. Um, you just opened up a new store here on Park Avenue, New York. How many years have you been in the watch industry? I started when I was 21. Now I'm 62, so we'll call it 41 years, Ariel. 41 years. And could you define in any short way how the industry has changed in those 40 years? The industry has changed dramatically in 40 years. I mean, we've seen the likes of all the companies being r rather small and independent to groups being formed and uh, things would happen within groups that we never had before. Example, we used to go to Basel and sit down with a company and we would see a collection and they would also have it divided into the European section or the Arab section or different parts of the world and we'd be able to pick. Now everything is consolidated. It's one collection that we pick. The whole world picks the same. So in that respect, it's changed. Uh, we used to be able to negotiate different deals with different companies. Now under the likes of the Richemont Group or Swatch Group or LVMH, terms are all the same for the different brands, margins are all the same for the different brands, and everything's become, you know, under one roof, more structured, but uh, more difficult for the independent, I would say. How has that given you new opportunities to be creative? Because a lot of creative opportunities seem to be in closed out. What are the areas that you as a retailer now get to be creative? Uh, we're closed out for various reasons. Uh, obviously, the merchandise that's offered is offered to all the world markets the same, so there's no more individuality. Everyone who stocks a particular brand starts to look like everybody else carrying that same brand. Right. Um, I think the way that we're trying to address this issue and moving forward is we're focusing today more on the independent watchmaker. We're trying to promote these gentlemen who are virtually unknown or, or not as well known as some of the bigger brands. Uh, they offer some super fine products, super high quality. And what's really nice about it is their pieces are truly rare because of the production level that they're at. So tell me about the personal decision that you had to make going from putting so much emphasis on these big brands that, you know, because of changes make them, the business relationship has changed with them. These independents come in. Well, the business relationship changed because the larger brands have all decided that they want to go directly to the consumer. So they've all endeavored in opening their factory boutiques. And by the way, let me preface this by saying I am definitely in favor of boutiques. I think boutiques are necessary. I think it offers the consumer a tremendous range of product which most stores cannot offer. Uh, the, the boutiques can offer the environment that the brand wants to portray to their customer base, whereas the independents really cannot. So to me, there's a lot of advantages to a boutique and boutique environment. It's just the way that the boutiques are doing business and the brands are doing business that makes it so difficult for all the independents to do business. You're, you're very well respected in what you do. Your Thank name, you. Your name gets popped up all the time, all over the world. And they see Cellini as being not just sort of like an icon of American uh, watch retailers, but also is like one of the ones doing it really well. What do you think you've done over the years that has led to enough good decisions to earn you this reputation? Well, I think we've, we've um, partnered up with good partners to begin with. Most of the brands that we uh, do business with, we've been doing business for an excess of 25 or 30 years. We're very loyal to the brands that we do business, and likewise, they've been very loyal to us. Um, so I attribute a lot of the success to that. Uh, in the last couple of years, I would say that our direction, we've seen some major changes in the industry, such as overproduction, uh, brand boutiques, uh, internet sales, the way that the business is being handled, the delivery of merchandise to us much later than it's delivered to maybe 
their store, uh, their their own boutiques, limited editions that we have no access to, mm -hmm. advertising that's been concentrating to the brand or the brand's outlet as opposed to the retail network. So we've seen a lot of things that's made it very difficult for us to operate or at least compete in, in an environment. And they've made it very difficult to compete with themselves. So we decided that, um, or I should say I decided about two years ago that we were going to start to develop the independent brands who we've always delved with in, you know, small bit. But right now we feel that the future of the watch business is the small independent gents. I think for your business case, that makes a lot of sense, for sure. You bring up loyalty, which is a term that is obviously used a lot in this industry for people that are very loyal, not very loyal. Um, where did you first learn the importance of loyalty, especially when it comes to luxury watches in this industry and how you do business? Well, the jewelry business in general is one of honor and one of loyalty. I Why mean, exactly? Well, deals, you know, when I started in the business um, in the 19, late 1970s, you could go into a diamond dealer, take a stone from the gentleman on a handshake, and if you said you were going to buy it, you did, and you, your word was your bond. That's mm -hmm. all basically you have in this world. Um, so the lo loyalty factor is very important. Honor is very important. Uh, telling the truth is very important in this industry. And unfortunately, as time goes on, things have weakened up. Nowadays, if you want to take a stone, everyone requires you to sign off and give your firstborn now. It's not like it was. Business has definitely changed, uh, as well within the watch industry has changed dramatically. So these changes have all happened on the industry side, and they've affected people like you and me. But to a degree, you have to insulate the consumer, right? You need to make sure that they see the industry as being uh, cohesive and having a degree of solidarity. Um, what techniques have you used over the years to make sure that your customers have as flawless and easy a purchasing experience as possible, despite these changes that are going on? Well, basically, a customer um, can buy the product that he wants anywhere. I was taught that uh, when you're in retail, you need your customers more than they need you. And I like to believe that the watch vendors need me more than I need them. So it kind of translates down. And uh, the clientele that we have could go and buy their product anywhere. They come to us for the selection that we offer. They come to us for the knowledge that we can offer, for the service we can offer. Um, the internet is a great source of education. It's a great source. People are using it today to buy everything. But you, you're taking away the element where a person goes online to buy something, they can't try it on. They can't see what it looks like on their wrist. If they have a problem servicing it, where are they taking it? And, you know, the watch companies want you to feel though you're part of this because oh if somebody buys something on the internet and we make the sale but they could go to you to have it repaired great you know that's that's uh, <laughs> you know so we're, we're offering service to our customers we're offering knowledge and we're offering selection and the nice thing that we do also is that we offer somebody most importantly a huge selection so they could come in and compare several brands of watches and uh, if they go into a store boutique they're basically looking at one brand. You have close to three dozen brands, is that correct? Correct. And how, who selects the brands in the store? Is that you? I do. And what kind of criteria do you use? Well, um, let me say that the criteria for the independence of the mainstream brands, is there... Does, is it different? Well, for me there is, because the mainstream brands is a little easier. You know that they're financially stable. Uh, you don't have to worry about that. Some of the independents are small individual watchmakers. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that scares us and should scare a consumer is, is this brand viable? Is this gentleman going to be around in five years? And if he's not around, can I get this piece fixed? Whereas the mainstream brands who have been around for, as they all say, hundreds of years, uh, are definitely more financially sound and have a stronger organization and will be here. So that doesn't come into play. When we look at a small brand, we obviously look at the movement. We look at the movement quality. Uh, we look and we talk to the watchmaker about finances. If we see that they're requiring payment in full before we get product, we That's get a, a little flag. leery. It's a, yeah. it's a red flag there. Um, if they're saying they want a percentage of a deposit to secure delivery, that I could live with. These are small independents. 
they don't have the financial wherewithal of some of the big brands and they do need that help. So we, we do consider that. But the most important aspect of it, I think, is the quality of the movement, the finish of the movement. I will buy an individual piece. I will time test it for a month. I will wear it. I will ask people what they think about it. And we get feedback that way as well. You do that yourself? I do. And you've been doing that for how many years? Oh, on the independent side for the last two to three years. So you've been basically a, a secret watch Again, reviewer. I, yeah, absolutely. My latest one was uh, Chet Pack. Okay. So I just bought a Chet Pack and I'm in the process of wearing that and testing that out. And do you, do you enjoy this review process? I think it's more of a, um, I have to be aesthetically uh, attracted to the watch to begin with. Sure. I have to like the movement, I have to like the finish. I also want to te time test it to see how it performs under my conditions. And I'll wear it on the weekend, I'll play golf in it, I'll do whatever is necessary. Um, and I get fee uh, some very good feedback from my clientele base. I'll ask them, what do they think of this? Some people think it's too boring, some will think it's too way out there. But if I see that it sparks an interest, that to me is something that's exciting. How often does a watch satisfy like almost everything that you like how it looks, nice finishing, but it doesn't perform well in terms of, you know, rate results? How often does that happen? Believe it or not, rarely. Yeah? Rarely. So usually these these are well performing machines. Absolutely. So that's that's a, that's a good thing, because at the end of the day, even though we don't need it, once you wear it, you still want it to tell time well Well, you well want enough. it to be, absolutely, you want it to be accurate. You want it to withstand some normal wear and tear. Um, some, of the, some of the things that I found is sometimes the strap mechanism or the closing mechanism is inferior. And we point that out to a manufacturer. How do they respond? Uh, well, we didn't concentrate on the buckle, you know, something to that effect. But, you know, you have to make it a point because if we're not telling them, who's going to tell them this? Do, do they understand that <clears throat> there's so much choice in luxury watches now that a small, well, uh, they think it's a small thing like a buckle, can make or break a sale? Do they get that? You know, I think if you point it out to them, I've pointed out to many companies that a dial and a strap could make or break a sale and usually does. Yeah. And when you think about what goes into a watch and the time spent to build the movement, test it, uh, QC, so on and so forth, that something so simple as a strap or a dial color could make the difference between a success and a failure in a product. Because you said it yourself, number one thing is aesthetics. We don't buy one watch over another because of aesthetics, because usually we choose ones that we like first. It's, the, it's like the little icing on the cake that ultimately gets you as a consumer to buy one over another. But it's true that it's it's the way that it looks. Like if you, something could look great on paper, but if you look <coughs> at it at a glance, you're like, don't like this thing, you'll d dismiss it outright. Correct. And that happens so quickly, but it's difficult to sort of create like a formula for what works and what doesn't work. Do you think that with your own taste over the last, <coughs> you know, several decades you've been doing this, when you look at a watch, you know, you're like, I, Leon, know that this is going to sell or doesn't sell, or, or do things still surprise you? You know, um, I will say that I've been very lucky. For the most part, I've been spot on, but I've missed some good ones. What so, are some of the ones you missed? Um, you know, some a brand could introduce a particular model, and I will just avoid that model. And lo and behold, that was a successful model in, in, in the brand, uh, whether it was... Uh, the Aquatimer by IWC, which personally I never liked, but it did very well. So sometimes you just can't predict what the consumers or what the public are, is going to gravitate to. What's something that you liked and for whatever reason didn't sell well? Maybe it was overpriced or something like that. What's something that like you you chose, you still think it's a great watch, but didn't do as well commercially as you would have liked? I think right now... I feel that D. Bethune, although they've, they're have they undergoing some changes um, structurally at the factory level, here's a brand that I think makes some of the most beautiful product in the world, finished unbelievably technology uh, that, that's involved, this Cilician balance wheels and so on. They're fabulous amazing. pieces, amazing. amazing pieces, yet they don't do commercially as well as I would have thought they would have done. Why do you think that is? I think they're a little out there. Um, designs are a little uh, away from the mainstream, but then again, you could argue, well, MB&F is out there. Right. Um, but that's his look, you know. So when you look at D. Bethune, they had watches that were basic two-hand watches, 
and then they would come out with a a two hand watch with a arched blue mirrored finished titanium going up the middle of the dial or a jump hour with the jump hour in the center of the dial so they they do get a bit creative and a bit different um, also there's not that much cohesiveness in the brand I find that the brands that have cohesive collections seem to do a lot better than brands that have um, many different looks in their line why do you think that is I think when you display the product it displays better if there is a cohesive look now when I say cohesive look what I mean is that the brand could show two different case shapes or different sizes but when you're dealing with a brand like the Bethune you have one one watch with movable lugs one watch that has teardrop lugs one watch that has that looks like a very normal timepiece another watch that, that has a backs that open up and uh, or goes horizontally across the wrist in black titanium with a window I mean there's some very unusual pieces that they offer do you think that maybe it's because when you have a cohesive look the consumer is funneled to simply choosing that version that they look Whereas with something like Deb and Toon, where you have very sort of remarkably different, they like it, but then they get into sort of a, a, a choice paralysis where they're like, I'm going to hold off because I like multiple ones and I don't know which one to choose. I don't even know if it's that so much, Ariel. I think that sometimes they just look at it and say, you know, that's great, but it's not for me kind of thing. Um, Although there has been some very successful models within their range. I mean, the DB28s mm -hmm. uh, did very, very well. And this year they've reintroduced and expanding on it. And I think uh, they came out with several variations in either the kind of blue or the old black titanium or the uh, star, what was it, the star wheels? I believe that's what. The did. star various? No, the. Uh, Oh, steel wheels. Steel wheels. Yeah. L let's let's change uh, topics for a second here. What point in your career do you feel that consumers have been uh, taking the most risks, either money-wise or creatively? What, is there a period of time that you can think about when, when consumers are just taking the most risks? Well, I, I don't know if they were taking risks. You, you have to understand this is a luxury industry, and we're selling luxury products. So... Uh, when you talk about risks, I think people think of risks as an investment. Um, people take risks in the stock market. Um, I don't view watches as a risk. This is a luxury item that somebody who, who wants to own a fine timepiece will buy. Now, there are those who do look at the watch industry or products as an investment. And I will tell you that if you're looking at watches as an investment, don't. I agree. I mean, do not buy a watch for investment. You can <laughs> get lucky. There are times that there are models that have fetched a lot more money years later than when you purchased it. When you're probably dead. But in general, let's face it, it's not an investment. It's no, something I for you to buy, wear, enjoy and ho hopefully it'll give you years I, of pleasure. I use the term land emotional investment which hopefully you're, you're down with. But the idea is that they're going to spend a little bit more on a design that's a little bit weirder versus something that's a little bit more comfortable and familiar. You know what I mean? I do. So I'm trying to... I'm trying, so you're saying that if people are, in general, in the overall market, more comfortable with taking risks, they might be a little bit more open-minded design-wise and uh, in terms of budget? I think so. I think that the, the greatest success was probably around 2007. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think that was the height where the Swiss watch industry, no matter what they made and no matter what we bought, everything seemed to sell. Really? Yeah, everything seemed to sell. 2008, we went through the financial crisis, so that was a different ball game. All oh, yeah. of a sudden, the expensive timepieces were not uh, viewed favorably and people were more conscious of um, more popular price product, I would say. Uh, things start when the economy is doing better people I think will vary out of their comfort zone a little more and buy something a little more obscure but people today are very 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 price conscious in what way um, there's 
a lot of product out there. There's a lot of comparisons that can be made. And unless you're offering something so much better, so much different than the competitors, you have to be competitively priced. And if you're not, the consumers will not gravitate to your product. And from your tone, I take it the watch brands don't always understand this logic. Correct. What do you say to them? You know, it's funny. They sit over there in Switzerland and they think that they could just sit there and build it and if you build it, they will come. <laughs> I, think, I think more research needs to be done by the Swiss manufacturing industry to see really what the consumers of different continents want. Because what we're successful with here in America doesn't mean it's going to be successful in Asia or the Mideast or other parts of the world. And just like what's successful in Russia doesn't mean it's successful in America. So back me up here because I'm saying something substantially similar to brands. And I say you need to go back to producing <clears throat> models that fit the taste of specific regions. And you should only sell in those regions. Well, there's always overlap within regions, sure. and this is this is where I was getting to in our first beginning of this conversation when we first started going to Basel years ago in the late 1970s. You'd sit down with the brand, and they would have a U.S. collection, and they would have the Middle East collection, and they would have the Asian collection. Now, we were first shown the American collection, but we could pick anything we wanted from those other collections. So, to tailor our stores for our clientele base. That should come back. I, I feel it should because now what happened is we don't necessarily have the exact same product as our competitors have because maybe we're dealing with a different clientele base. Maybe we're dealing with more Asians or South Americans or Middle Easterns and we have clients for that product. With but, independence, are you able to move in that direction? Meaning, are you able to say to them, this type of product works for our customers and our store? Are they willing to make unique products for you? The good thing about the independence is that most of them have a tremendous amount of integrity. And um, for example, I was sitting with one independent watchmaker and I wanted to order product in rose gold and in platinum of a particular model. And this individual watchmaker had only made a series of 10 pieces in rose gold and 10 pieces in platinum, and he would not make any more. I asked him if he would do a different dial or a variation. He said, no, we, I was only going to make 10 in platinum, and that's it. So here was a gentleman with integrity. So the only thing that was left for me to purchase was product in white gold or titanium. So after sitting with him for two days, I realized that he never made a watch in yellow gold. So I said, you know, if, if I wanted to buy 10 pieces from you in yellow gold, would you limit it like you did the platinums and the rose? He said, absolutely. Okay. So we could adapt and work around these things. So to show you, they are, they do have integrity because he wouldn't make any more platinum or rose. And we were able to finagle working in a different metal that he hasn't worked with yet. So let's imagine for a moment you had that same conversation with one of the bigger brands. How would that have gone differently? They would have made it for themselves. <laughs> so they would have taken your idea, been like, Leon, thank you so much for that. And then they would have made it. And it's happened many times in the I'm past. sure. I'm sure. Yeah. I'm, you and I are both people that have uh, given prolifically uh, ideas to the industry that they have made very good use of. We haven't necessarily seen the, the fruits of that. But we can say, hey, they did it. Right. Absolutely. They have done it. New York City is, for lack of a better term, a very unique place in the world. <coughs> and there's a particular style here, and there is a, a taste. What You travel a lot. What is a watch taste or a, a, a consumer behavior that's unique to this city that you found that just doesn't seem to work other places but works really well here? You know, it's hard for me to say because I really only know New York. I don't really know what what works in other parts of this country and or other parts of the world because well, I've never spent any amount of time in there to know what those people want. I will know, I will say that um, New York, unlike the, I think the rest of the United States where it is so heavily dominated by Rolex and or Omega, mm -hmm. I think New York is less so. 
I think uh, people here are looking to be a little different. They're not really following the crowd with some of these brands, although there's a great percentage of people that do buy these products. Yeah, Don't there's no shortage wrong. of Rolex. There's no no shortage right of here. Rolex. But I think people here are a little more experimental, a um, little more cutting edge. They want something different. They want something on the wrist that they're not going to see on everybody. And I think at the height in, I'd say, about 2007, I can't begin to tell you how many CEOs and executives would come in and say that the first 10 minutes of their meeting was everyone passing around their wristwatches to see who, who was wearing what. Right. Uh, I don't know if that, and I don't think that takes place today. I think today it's a little more low-key. People are wearing Apple watches. <laughs> um, but there's still a great demand for fine timepieces. I mean, it is a mechanical marvel that when you think about it is working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and if you ran your car like that, you'd be taking your car in for service every three days. Sometimes people take this out of context, but I call it a, a, an adult toy. It is, absolutely. And if you appreciate it for that and you understand that it's supposed to be fun, and you're supposed to have a good time wearing it, it's supposed to make you feel good, then I think you understand a lot more about the benefit. If you try to, like, if you try to use logic to justify the purchase, it's an emotional purchase. Uh, you, can't logic, you can't logically justify it, no. but you can compare. So you can, you can take an illogical desire, which is to buy an expensive thing for the wrist that doesn't do more than make you happy, but then you can logically compare one to the other. And I think that's funny how people do that. It's done all the time like that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's done all the time. So you, you see consumers all the time. Now that sort of the, you know, and, and again, we're, we're responsible for a lot of it, but internet research, mm -hmm plays a big part of it. What do you see differently that happens in the store? Do you see consumers on their phones right there comparing? Because they come in here and they want to make a decision. I think a, lot of, I think a lot of customers um, have already done their research and they, you know, it's very hard to find some place where you could go into and compare two or three or four different brands that you might be interested in. So they do this pre- comparison via the internet. Sure. Whereas in our establishment, they could come in and basically and hopefully find those four products that they wanted right, to compare. Right, because you have so many watches. So in that respect, we have a very big advantage. But I think a lot of people, because of where they live or because of um, geography, they don't have that advantage. So they pre-do this research on the internet. Then when they're coming into a shop, their their minds are probably whittled down to one or two pieces, mm -hmm. and they like to see the two pieces. There go there is another problem. Does the store they go to have the two pieces? Right. So if they go to a brand boutique, they can only see that brand. Now if they're only concentrating on one brand, that's great. They could go to a boutique and get a very big selection. But if they wanted to see a product that's distributed by Richemont and a product distributed by Swatch, you're not going to find it under one roof by a brand boutique. So stores like yours are going to become less common, but the stores like yours that exist are going to be stronger because of that. Is that the way? Would you well, agree with that I, statement? Well, in a way, I, I see that the, the brands are cutting down on their distribution and their points of sale. I think they want to direct more of the sales through their websites and through their brand boutiques. So the nor nor the natural course of events would be if they have 100 points of sale in this country, let's bring it down to 80, let's bring it down to 60, let's bring it down to 40. And we will have six boutiques, we'll go to eight, we'll go to 10, so they'll naturally pick up some of that business. Right, right. And I think that's the way it's gonna go. So to answer your question, yes, I think there's gonna be fewer players out there. So. This focus on independence makes a lot of sense, but part of the problem, and this is, you know, you've been in this for so long, you develop a certain taste. The watches from independence you really like tend to be more high-end, and you abandon a lot of price points. What is the solution to getting entry-level watches, or I'll just call them more mainstream luxury, but also having this focus on independence. How does that work? Are there so, you start making your own watches now? So let me just say this to you, Ariel, because when I went into the business in 1977, I had a gentleman who was 80 years old in the diamond business and kind of, you know, took me under his wing and, and taught me certain things. 
And one of the things he taught me from the very beginning was the jewelry and watch industry is a bottomless pit. Meaning, there are very few businesses in the world where there is no amount of money that could fill your shelves. <laughs> the jewelry business is one of those businesses. So you could have a store that's filled up with $100,000 worth of sterling silver jewelry, and you could put in one case that's one foot by one foot wide, $100 million worth of colored diamonds. Right. So it's, it's literally a bottomless pit. And the lesson he taught me was, you can't be everything to everybody. So to answer your question, what happens with the more popular price point independent brands? There are a lot of people out there with these this product, but I can't be that person to everybody. So we kind of set our sights that we want to be the best at what we're doing and we're going to concentrate at the higher level of the industry. Now, there's a lot of business that we're losing because we're not at that lower segment for these independents. But like I said, we can't be everything to everybody. So I'm, I'm theorizing here. Uh -huh. The hope is that somebody gets into watches from one of these mainstream brands that mm -hmm. now has sort of an increasingly direct-to-consumer model, but at some point in their career as a watch lover, they're going to get increasingly curious, increasingly well-versed in the sort of variety of brands, and hopefully have enough money, and then they come into Cellini, and you're kind of waiting for them to graduate to your level. Would that be correct or incorrect? Well, listen, um we welcome anybody, a novice collector, an experienced collector, somebody who's looking for any kind of product because, you know, you never know what somebody's going to fall in love with and want to acquire. Sometimes people see something and they'll just say, you know what, I'm going to wait a year till I can afford it. Yeah. So I don't, um, I just can't, you know, space in New York City is limited. Uh, funds to stock brands is limited. And to be the best at what we do, we're trying to concentrate at one level. If we had the time, effort, space, finances, we would probably expand it at the lower level as well. Right. But we don't. Eventually. And eventually, who knows, who knows? You're gonna be in it for another 40 years. <laughs> who knows? If not me, my girls. <laughs> so let me ask you this, because again, you, you said something interesting. You said you want to be more important to the watch brands than, than they are to you. And for the independents, I think you are. At some point, I think that it behooves you to make create decisions for them. And you know, making a, a, another platinum case, for example, or a different dial is one thing, but, but you could take it further. You could communicate to them what works in this market. They don't have that information. Correct. Are you comfortable with ever being more of a creative director on these watches that you're selling? Is that something that you're ever interested as a person, as a store to go into? You know, this is something that interests me. It absolutely does. But my main focus right now with the independence is really to get some of these guys on the map. Right. These are names that most consumers have not heard of. A lot of people within the watch industry don't even know these people. And I feel it's important to let's get these guys on the map and launched and eventually you know we could be, give them input on what we would like to see and hopefully they will execute it but right now my main focus is really trying to build them up so that they have you know a notoriety and if it's successful in America maybe it'll become successful in Japan and other parts of the so world. So what's the strategy for this because <coughs> these are brands that you sell you might have a, a exclusivity in this region but definitely not necessarily the country and so you want to boost them up, but you also want to capture the reward of your efforts of boosting them up. What's the strategy to do that? The strategy is very simple. Most of these guys manufacture very few product. So if a company is ma making 100 watches a year for the world, or 150, or 200, and the U.S. sees 20% of that number, that's a good number for us. Sure. And if there's somebody else who's going to handle the brand in the Midwest or the West Coast, there's plenty of room for all of us. So we could capture our market, and it's good for everybody. We don't have to have exclusivity for the United States or even in a particular city. There's plenty out there to go around. So what happens years from now, this will be five to ten years from now, where the big brands start possibly crawling back? 
and want attention in a way that they haven't received from you in a while. What what's your what's your plan for that? My plan is well, okay. So the way I look at it is we've been very uh, loyal to these brands. We've supported them in good times. We've supported them in bad times. We are still loyal to brands. We know every brand cannot stay hot for an infinite amount of time, so they have their lulls, and we are loyal to them. But when the companies start doing certain things that, to me, cross the line, at that point, I have to bow out of doing business with them. Right. And at that point, once I bow out, I'm out. Period. No coming back. Okay. That's that's a good policy. That's a good policy. Um, everybody wants to know about the future. No one can predict it. Uh, if only we could, right? Right. Um, we are in a time of uh, conservative buying, I would say. That's the way I see it. People are looking for value, as you said. Um, how would you articulate, as a guy that likes watches, where your own tastes are going? I think that the market is going to respond to people like you as opposed to coming up with their own decisions. So I'm just curious. You as a watch collector, how I do you I think I about? sell more today of classic timepieces than we ever did. Well, define for people what that is. Cause it, a, s- a simple watch, a round case watch with two hands, possibly a date, possibly a sub-second hand or a central second hand. Something timeless that was fashionable 50 years ago and probably will be fashionable 50 years from now. Um, in the late 2000s, we saw, like I said, whatever they built, as crazy as it was, it would sell. Today, people are a lot more conservative in their purchases. They're a lot smarter in their purchases. They look for long-lasting value in their purchases. And I don't think people are buying as many luxury timepieces as they used to. For example, a lot of my collectors and people I've been doing businesses for years who would buy 10 or 12 or 8 watches a year, today they're buying one or two. 12 is a lot of watches a year. Well, a lot of people buy a lot of watches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Um, So I think people are buying less. I think that the uh, smart watches has definitely affected the industry to a degree. The uh, lux- But the luxury industry, which is what I'd like to think that we are in, will remain successful if the, if the companies do not overproduce product. They have to produce less than the demand. They always have to produce less than the demand because once they exceed the demand, then it's not luxury anymore. And this is this fine... This is this knife edge dilemma that they're always faced with. And they say, you know, if we sold X amount, we could make more, we'll sell more. But there comes a point where that more becomes more than the consumers out there are, and then we have a glut, and that's not healthy. Have you seen any signs that they're able to uh, incorporate that type of discipline? Because I think to produce less requires discipline, and that's not something that they've always been known for. I think they learned a valuable lesson in the last two years. <laughs> I think that um, with the production that was ramped up for the Chinese market in the last four or five years, and then when China decided that um, they were no longer going to consume and the Chinese government put a heavy tax on product imported. I think the Swiss industry took a big hit on that. They concentrated too much on one market. There was a a glut of product out there. Uh, They were feverishly trying to buy back product, destroy product, dump product, whatever they needed to do, they did. So I think now, and what I'm seeing in the last year, is that they are definitely cutting back because goods are scarcer to get. And that's from every company. Right. So I know Rolex is holding back product. Richemont is holding back product. Swatch Group, I believe, is holding back product. And um, it's helped. I I see an uptick in business. When things aren't readily available in the luxury business, that's when people want it. It's it's a psychological game. Absolutely. Absolutely. But it works. Let me ask you a question. If your wife walked into Hermes and wanted a particular pocketbook and she could get it any time she wanted, in any color she wanted, she wouldn't want it. Right. 
She'll just the wait fact that she can get it is because that's well, it's what a motivator wants. for purchase. Right. Absolutely. The two things that I have found that the watch industry doesn't truly understand, even though these are two words they use a lot, uh, is service and relationship. And we know that a customer uh, will buy something that may not necessarily be their top choice if that person thing treats them better, makes them feel special. What is the sort of Cellini strategy towards applying service um, as well as relationship that gets people to work with you but to keep coming back? So let's, let's handle those two questions separately. Let's talk about service first. So service is something that we give to customers and in turn we expect from the companies that are servicing the product for us. And I really feel that there is a breakdown within the entire Swiss watch industry for service. I think their production over the last 10 years has increased dramatically. I mean, you know as well as I do how many companies have made two and three and increased factory sizes to increase their production. They've pumped out a lot more product, they've sold a lot more units, and yet the amount of service and the people employed in service has not significantly increased. No. So what we're seeing is a watch that goes in for service that should be a four week or six week turnaround and it's looking like four months and six months. If it's fixed properly at all. I don't even want to go down that road. <laughs> so this is a very, very big problem. And I think it's one of the major problems that the Swiss watch industry faces. And it makes you look bad even though it's not your fault. A hundred percent. I think it's the biggest problem they have. And I can't begin to tell you, a, I'm not going to mention names, but a very prominent Swiss watch brand, probably one of the most prominent luxurious brands there are how many customers I have that come in that say they'll never buy that product again because it went in for service and it's a minimum of eight months <laughs> so imagine you do you buy a new car you drive it out of the showroom and you own it for three months and then you have to have it serviced and then when you go in for service they tell you it's six or eight months to get it serviced there's no loaner either I don't think you're buying that car again no no, because okay, you bought it to drive it. Right. So this has been a very, very, very big problem for the Swiss watch industry as a whole. Um, and it's, it's happened because of the increase of product and not enough emphasis was given to having ample people to fix this product. And it doesn't happen overnight. These people have to be trained and educated on these particular movements and it takes time for them to get up to snuff. Um, as far as what we do for services, first of all, we have, we have an excellent watchmaker. If a product is out of warranty, we make sure that our watchmaker will attend to it because it's already out of warranty by the factory and we could get much quicker and better service with our own watchmaker than we can relying on the company. Sure, sure. So that's one thing we try to do. Um, on a new product that we get, if it has to go back to the company for service, depending on what the issue is, if it's any length of time, and when I say length, more than six weeks, I'll tell the company I want a new product. You know, this gentleman had the watch, it's two months old, you tell me six weeks, you're going to have it as much time as he had it, we want a new product. Swap it out. What do they say? I will tell you that they've been very, very receptive to that of late. It was not the norm before, but... It has been, it just happened with one product that we just sold three weeks ago. It was not working. The gentleman noticed, it, no, excuse me, it was working. The gentleman noticed a fine hairline scratch on the dial. Oh. So we called the company, they replaced it. it it's funny that what you said that they used to say no to this, now they're more open-minded. I've had multiple brands say to me, and I think you'll sort of appreciate the, the, the amusement of this comment, even if we say no, just keep asking because maybe we'll say yes. Yeah. I'm just like, what, what is that? What is that? Like, I just have to keep knocking on the door all the time? Well, some companies are definitely more receptive than others. Uh, there's no two ways about it. And I find certain groups are more receptive than other groups in doing that. Um, 
there was another particular brand that we do business with that at one point was absolutely horrific in service and within one year they turned it around and I will tell you today they're probably the best in service we send them a product and within 10 days it's back that's a success story that's definitely a success story so when there's a service issue then comes in the uh, the relationship side of the equation as well as in the, the initial sale um, the 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 watch industry <coughs> always sort of seems to have this idea that as a consumer you should be very fortunate that this product even exists for you to buy which is a little antithetical to sort of the traditional American customer service and relationship <coughs> notion. So they need people like Leon and Cellini to implement that relationship with the consumer that helps facilitate ongoing sales. So what's your what's your strategy? You know the there? Co- the companies have gotten a lot better though, Ariel. I will tell you they you know the attitude of the Swiss watch industry to the retailer and to the consumer, I would say has gotten light year has jumped light years and they have gotten a lot better than they were encouraging uh the 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 brands would force feed us goods you know you will buy it you will like it you will sell it no matter what it was nowadays it's you know if you don't want it no problem if you like to buy it fine so their attitudes have changed as far as selling into us um they're they're no longer hammering us to buy a certain amount they're they're more interested now not with the sell into our store but with our sell out sure because they know if our sell out is good then they're going to have a good sell and in. just for everyone to understand that is selling watches to the consumer versus putting them in a store correct so they're more concerned with what I could deliver to consumers whereas before they were more interested in how much they could sell me and right. put it on my shelves that's all fine and dandy, but if it's not walking out, eventually that stops, and that's not healthy for the brand because then you have on your shelves old product, you have on your you don't have the current line of product, and as a retailer, I think it's very important that we always represent the newest and the most current models for a brand, so the consumer could come in and see those pieces. If we're sitting with a lot of product that's older and not selling, we don't have room to put in the new product because we only have X amount of space per brand. That's hard to get rid of old product. Correct. So the brands know that it's to their benefit to work with you and to trade out old merchandise for current merchandise. And in turn, it does make a big difference. <laughs> okay. Um Leon, thank you so much. Everyone, this has been Leon Adams uh, with Cellini Jewelers in New York City. Uh, They have a beautiful new store here on Park Avenue, and I recommend that you come see it. Thank you so much, Leon. Thank you, Ariel. Take care.